I mean, any postman who would behave like this would be a fool. He knows that, that he's been given these letters to distribute for the sake of others. And, and if we forget that this covenant that has bound us to God, is, if we forget that it's also for the sake of the nations, and then we forget who we are, and we are as foolish as that postman. Now, all of these kind of four things are kind of the backstory for what's going on in the text. Uh, the problem is that God says, I want to be your exclusive king. I want you to serve and worship me alone. And, and any leader that I take and put over you, right, from Moses to David to whoever, they, they have to mediate that relationship. They, they're in place to nourish the relationship that we have. They're, they're supposed to build up and strengthen our relationship. That's the goal of those leaders. And, and any leader I give you has got to nourish and mediate the relationship, strengthen it, build it up, so that you, the people of God, will serve me more faithfully. So that's the role. Um, and let's kind of get into that a little bit, the role of the king. right? Israel said, you know, this is kind of the touchstone as to why we have this passage. We fear the Ammonites coming against us. What we need is a king like all the other nations. Right? And, and the king that they want, the king that is like all the other nations, is one who is, you know, six foot seven. He's 275 pounds of rippling muscle. He's, he's trained in martial arts and he can handle a sword and it wouldn't hurt if he knew a few Jedi mind tricks to boot. You know, kind of like me. Obviously not, right? I mean, this is a king who's incredible. Um, somebody who inspires fear into the hearts of others, can lead Israel into battle to fight their enemies. The problem wasn't that they asked for a king. God was going to give them one, and, and he wanted them to have one, but he doesn't want them to have a king like this, in this fashion, because this took away from their covenant relationship. It took away from them trusting in him as their king alone. And so here, here's kind of the question that the text begs. How could a king become what God wanted it to be, wanted him to be? How could a king not become a king merely to fight Israel's battles, but rather to nourish and to strengthen that covenant relationship? How could a king kind of fit into the covenant and be drawn in as this covenant mediator? Right? That, that's kind of the question that this part of Samuel is answering. And, and we find just before our passage, the, the two verses before our passage, uh, there's, there's this story of the covenant ceremony at Gilgal. And, and what happens there is they, they, Samuel says, let's go up to Gilgal and we'll renew the kingship. And so all the people go there and, and they renew the kingship. And, and it's important that it happens here at Gilgal because Gilgal was the first place where Israel established itself in the land. Right after Joshua led them into the land, they stop where? They stop at Gilgal. And they have this, you know, this tremendous covenant ceremony. And there they commit themselves to being faithful to God. And now they come back to Gilgal, the place where they started life in the land. And they come there to recommit again to being faithful in the land. So they go to Gilgal. They say to renew the kingship, but, but it's hard to understand exactly what's going on here. Some people think it's, we're going to Gilgal, and we're going to establish Saul as king, right? But other commentators argue, and I think they're right, that, that what's taking place here is not going to Gilgal to renew Saul's kingship. I mean, Saul didn't really need his kingship renewed yet. He hadn't really even been king yet. So it couldn't really have been renewed. In fact, what, what's taking place, I think, is Let's go to Gilgal to renew God's kingship. Let's be reminded that God is, first of all, our king. Let's renew his covenant kingship over us. And in light of that kingship, let's establish Saul as our earthly king. Let's remember who's really king, and then let's make Saul our king. And then they have this fellowship offering to celebrate that they renewed this relationship with God. And Samuel stands up and, he, and he's got this goal. He wants Israel to focus on this covenant faithfulness all over again and to bring the king into that covenant. And, and so he starts by saying, hey, why did you ask for a king when the style of leadership that he had was already working? 
He says, did I ever take anything from you? Did I ever in any way wrong you? Did my leadership ever fail you? And they say no, and that's kind of the first five verses. And then this next section, uh, he says, well, what about God? Did God ever fail you? You know, God took you out of Egypt. And then we, we have this passage which kind of drum, jumps over Israel's history. God took you out of Egypt, and he, he brought you to the land. And, and then he, uh, Samuel unfolds the whole book of Judges in, in some detail. Right? And we've kind of looked at this cycle of what goes on in the book of Judges. It says, don't you remember you'd turn away from the Lord and the Lord would send judgment among, from the nations and then you would recognize your sin and then, then you'd cry out to the Lord and then you'd repent from your sin and then he would send a judge to liberate you. And, right? and, and didn't God hear you every time that you cried out? Didn't God have the strength and the power to protect you from your enemies? Then why are you asking for a king? And then after that, he, he kind of lays out the options in verse 13. He says, now, you know, here. Saul, here's the king that you've chosen, the one that you asked for. Here's Saul. He's big. He's powerful, right? He's a strong king, just like you want it. But then he says right after, he says, see the king I have set over you. Which one are you going to choose, right? Are you going to choose the king that you want, the king that's going to fight your battles, or the king who's going to trust me and mediate the covenant relationship? Which one are you going to choose? And then kind of at the heart of it all, in, in verses 14 and 15, he, he goes over that, that uh, covenant dynamic again, right? Um, and this is similar to a passage in Deuteronomy, except in this passage, unlike Deuteronomy, the word king is now included in this relationship. He says, if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good, great. But if you do not obey the Lord and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. Right? He says basically the covenant's still in effect. It's still in place. And so the question becomes, will your king enable you to keep the covenant? Or will your king stand in the way of the covenant and lead you kind of down the garden path of disobedience and unfaithfulness? What matters, what matters most, is your covenant faithfulness. Can your king help and strengthen and nourish that relationship? That's the question that Samuel is concerned about here. And then Samuel does something interesting. He says basically, to show you that I'm speaking for the Lord, I'm going to give you a sign. And I don't know about you, but maybe for me, I, I was looking at it at first, and I, that sign didn't really strike me as all that much, right? But here it is, the middle of harvest, and it's the dry season, and there's not much rain at all. And he says, all right, here it is, the harvest season, and I'm going to call on the Lord, and I'm going to bring a thunderstorm like you've never seen before, and then when you see that, you'll realize what evil things you've done in breaking the covenant with, a, with the Lord. No, not suggesting that the actions around terrorists have been prophetic or anything like that, but we saw some thunder and lightning over the past few years like we haven't seen in a while. And here in our story, the Lord sends thunder and rain. And the people see that and they put two and two together and they, and they beg Samuel. They say, Samuel, please pray to your God that we will not die. We, we've added to all of our other sins, you know, which is apparently a pretty big pile, we've added to all our other sins the sin of asking for a king. And Samuel immediately says, okay, now you're in a position to receive God as your king, to recognize what you've done, and, and now that you realize that, that you are God's covenant people, that now you're therefore in a place where God can help you and renew you and, and set you back on the path again. And he says, don't be afraid. You, certainly what you've done is, is wrong, it's evil. Yet don't turn away from the Lord. Serve him with your old, whole heart. Make that recommit in that way. Keep your eyes focused on God as your king and don't turn away to useless idols. He says, God, because of his great name, the, the Lord, he, he's not going to reject you. He's already attached his name to you. He's not going to reject you. He's been pleased to make you his very own. But get your eye back on God as your king. And as for me, Samuel says, I'm, I'm going to continue to pray. I'm going to continue to teach you and, and to help you. 
And then he turns and kind of for a third time he says, what God wants from you though, right? It's covenant fidelity. In verse 24 he says, be sure to fear the Lord, to serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider all of the great things that he has done for you. And then one more warning and he finishes it with this. Yet, if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. And so it kind of ends this section from you know, chapters 9 through 12 where, where God wants to, to make Israel ready as a kingdom to fulfill his purposes, his covenant purposes. And the kingship comes into that co- covenant. And, and now the rest of the story of Samuel can unfold. We won't get into that too much. But basically the question is, how will this kingdom under this king fulfill God's covenant purposes? What's going to happen? And so we take this story and we look at it in 2016 and, and we wonder in some ways, well, how in the world can we ever relate to this? I mean, it's hard enough for us to just imagine even what a king is like. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in the children's message, uh, when Frank was leading the children's message, you remember he had the kids wearing those white crowns and uh, he asked them the question, what does a king do? Kids were all like, oh. I don't really know. I don't know. What does a king do? I mean, it's just not an image. We don't, we don't have a concept of kingship because we don't have kings, right? It's hard to imagine somebody with absolute power over life and death, with authority over everyone, uh, that military presence of kingship. And, and despite kind of our distance and maybe even differing views on kingship, there's, there's still so much to take away from God's word as we hear it here from 1 Samuel 12. I mean, first, that covenant, right, that, that still binds God to his people and his people to him, it's still there, right? You, you've heard, I hope, again, this call from the text to, uh, to complete loyalty, to exclusive loyalty as God, who is the king. And I hope you've heard also that, that this dynamic is very much in effect, that trust in the Lord, to walk in obedience, to love the Lord with your whole heart, and then there is life. Stop disbelieving and disobeying. Stop loving idols or you die. Right now, I hope you've sensed that dynamic as, you know, even applicable even in your own life. And and then also heard this incredible truth that God's name is tied to us. Right? In a very real way, we are called Christians. Christians. Right? And that name, Christian, was first given, if you read through the book of Acts, it was first given in, at Antioch to say um, people whose lives were tied to the person of Christ. Right? And it was probably first intended, calling people Christians, it was probably first intended as a derogatory thing. Um, but God has taken his name and he's attached it to us. And, and we can profane it or we can honor it. Right? We have that ability in the choices that we make. And I also hope that you've heard that this covenant is always there, not just for our sake, but for the sake of the nations. You know, when God binds himself to us and and blesses us with salvation, it's so that the nations might know. Because the covenant binds together God's people throughout history. And and I think you've already heard of this kind of covenant fidelity in the text. But maybe what's so different about our situation and case is that we've read the whole Old Testament, right? We know from the rest of the Old Testament that and maybe it's only three, maybe it's four or five, at most it's eight of all those kings, of all 39 of those Israelite kings, maybe three, maybe five, maybe eight, were faithful. They they all seem to lead Israel down the garden path. And the, and the problems was that Israel's heart was, was so deeply shaped by idols. And so was their king. And so Israel, in some ways, actually shows us as in a mirror who we are. The rabbi was once asked, what is it about you Jews? How are you different? And the rabbi said, well, we're not. We're just like everybody else but more so. We're just like everybody else, but more so. And so we see in Israel who we are. Hearts prone to idolatry. Hearts easily led down the garden path. 
Hearts that, that come to the end of themselves and cry out to God, liberate us from this idolatry all around us. And the trouble was that their king 